Hi, I'm Mike Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is geography. All eyes and ears have been on the Gulf of Persia, the Straits of Hormuz, the Sea of Oman, as tensions between Iran and the United States continue to mount. But there is another battle taking place, a battle which needs our attention and monitoring. It's the battle brewing in OPEC between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The battle is massive. The battle's roots are basic and simple. The issue at stake is the date of the next OPEC meeting. The tensions and the battling will continue on long after the OPEC meeting is decided upon and convened. That's how high the stakes are and how proud and self-important the battling nations are. Originally, the meeting was scheduled for June 25th and 26th, the same time as the G20 meeting. Because of recent events and the role of Iran in the rise of tensions in the Middle East, Russia, a non-OPEC member, together with Saudi Arabia, a full-fledged OPEC member, proposed delaying the meeting one week until after the G20 on July 1st and July 2nd. July 1st would be the day all 14 traditional OPEC members met on, and July 2nd, the gathering would also include the non-OPEC members like Russia. Over the past few years, Russia has exercised much more influence in OPEC than most other countries, including member nations, except for Saudi Arabia. Russia's role is increasing, while Iran's role is decreasing. It's like a seesaw. Once upon a time, Iran was the powerhouse in OPEC, always battling and challenging Saudi Arabia. Iran was powerful, even as recently as last year. In 2018, Iran was pumping and selling 2.5 million barrels of oil per day. Today, because of U.S. sanctions, and they're successful, Iran is pumping a mere 500,000 barrels per day. By contrast, today Saudi Arabia and Russia combined, those two countries alone account for over 40% of the total output of OPEC. That is significant. No matter the date of the meeting, the agenda of OPEC in general in OPEC's headquarters in Vienna is very clear. OPEC intends to extend the already agreed upon oil output cap. The deadline for that appears to expire the end of June. Member nations and other participating nations will discuss continuing on with the cap and thereby limiting the amount of oil that floods into the marketplace. This is the opposite of what Iran wants. Iran wants and needs all limits removed. That way, the Iranians can sell as much oil as they can to whichever countries they can. Iran needs the cash. They don't need limits. Iranian leadership was livid when the original cap was put into place, and they have been counting the days and months until the agreement expires. In OPEC, as in many other matters in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Russia set the tone. Iran is marginalized, and they do not like being in that position. They are not alone. Venezuela has also dropped to nearly the same status as Iran in the OPEC pecking order. Their internal economic and political conflicts have nat naturally moved them onto the sidelines of OPEC. Iran has not taken their new status well. Russia is worried about the international market. They are worried about the stability in the region. Above all, Russia is worried about the unpredictability of Iran. Saudi Arabia is worried about the Shiite Iran attacking Sunni tar uh, targets in the region. Unlike in the West, where access to and availability to fossil fuels and energy are replete with ups and downs and played like a game, the Saudis and Iran are locked into an ageless internal Muslim conflict dating back to the period just after the death of Muhammad. The history of OPEC is the history of a series of conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Until this go-round, setting OPEC meeting dates was always very simple. Dates were announced and agreed upon. This time, Russia was correct in wanting to move the meeting date. The G20 is composed of the most developed countries in the world, 20 of them. Those countries combined are responsible for 90% of the global world product, the GWP. Because of the important and pivotal roles they play in the world economy, every single member of the G20 is invested in regional stability and the price of oil. The G20 is not interested in instability. And here, too, when they meet, the agenda will be centered on the oil industry and on Iran. 
Those items will be front and center, no matter when the meeting takes place and where. The smarter, easier, more effective, more practical, and more informed move for OPEC et al. would always be to meet after the G20, not before. Iran is poised for battle. Russia is seen by Iran as a potential ally. So rather than battling an ally, Iran is concentrating all their venom and energy on their natural enemy, Saudi Arabia. Expect fireworks. I've also been thinking about the importance of Jewish summer camp. Summer camp is one of the most, uh, single most important Jewish traditions a Jewish child can experience. The Jewish summer camp experience is more than a ritual, not just an indulgence. Demographic studies about Jewish identity underscore Jewish summer camp as one of the only few Jewish experiences that leads to a positive Jewish identity. Summer camps are up there with trips to Israel and attendance at Jewish day schools as the foundation blocks for securing Jewish commitment. The recipe for summer camp fun are pretty simple. It's fun and it's very easy to deal with. Jewish camps remove kids from their parents and from their schools and plop them down in nature with other Jewish kids. The only responsibility attendees have is to enjoy one another and enjoy being Jewish. Each Jewish camp offers different Jewish components, but being Jewish is the equalizer among them. Some are more Jewish, others are less Jewish, but regardless of where a camp is on the spectrum of Jewish, the goal is to instill something Jewish in every camper. And for the most part, the recipes work. It all began in the 1800s in the New England mountains. Summer camps, not Jewish summer camps, but non-denominational summer camps, were a refuge for kids living oppressive lives in urban industrial centers. The idea was to introduce them to fresh air, and in fact, some of the original camps were actually called fresh air camps. It did not take long for Jews to realize the greatness of what was developing into a real summer institution and hop on the bandwagon. When they did catch on, Jewish organizations and groups and even individual families organized and brought children to the mountains, especially to the area known as the Borscht Belt in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Jewish camping became a way to educate and even indoctrinate. They had an agenda. In the summer camp, ideological groups were able to instill their specific brand of ideology and tradition. Ultra-Orthodox camps, Zionist camps, socialist camps, communist camps, reform camps, conservative camps, even socialist Zionist camps riddled the mountains. Most camps were affiliated with some cause, movement, or organization. Most of the private camps put the emphasis on sports and had intramurals with other Jewish summer camps. Some of the Zionist camps tried to turn their campers into chalutzim, pioneers. Socialists and communist camps recreated their microcosm. They created many worlds following the communist motto and dictum of to each according to their need and to each according to your ability. All to be accomplished, of course, during a two, four, or eight-week period in the Catskill Mountains. There were camps where campers were not only allowed to speak, were only allowed to speak Hebrew, others only allowed to speak Yiddish. There were camps that created many kibbutzim in Sullivan County. They had many farms, and city-bred campers were taught to till the crops, milk the cows, tend the chicken coops, and collect eggs, and they loved it. Camp legends abound. One Jewish summer camp legend I've heard often, but only secondhand, is that over a 24-hour period of survival day, according to the stories I've been told by the children and grandchildren, the survival day participants, campers were dropped off somewhere with no food, no money, and told they had 24 hours to get back to camp. Since it's kids and grandkids telling the stories, I assume everyone made it back. I've also heard legends about camps that sent kids with pushkas Tzedakah boxes, asking for tzedakah on Main Street in Monticello. Over the years, I've asked people how, given the vast assortment and array available, the camps they attended were selected. Many answered that their parents had no idea where they were sending their kids. They just wanted them out of the city for the summer. Many said the camp choice was determined by price. But in the 1990s, it became social. Summer camps were selected on the basis of where other kids went. Today, selecting a Jewish summer camp for your child is like choosing a college. I spent four summers in a Zionist summer camp in the Borscht Belt. 
those four summers had such a transformative impact on my life that I couldn't tear myself away and spent another decade on the camp's educational staff. It was without a doubt the most exciting, creative, and significant educational experience in which I have ever participated. I'm not alone when I say that the people I met in my summer camp are, to this day, some of my closest friends and respected colleagues. The Borscht Belt, alas, is dying, but Jewish summer camps thrive on, and that's a good thing. Jewish summer camps are good for Jews and Jewish identity, a four- or eight-week infusion that lasts a lifetime. Coming up, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. All the pieces we're going to examine today come from the New York Post. Two are columns, but the first is an editorial. Remember, an editorial is unsigned and is the point of view of the editorial board. This editorial was published in print on May 29, 2019, and entitled Germany's New Old Shame. Online, on May 28th, the title is almost the same, just missing the S. It reads, Germany, New Old Shame. The title is a play on words of Herzl's famous pamphlet, Alte Neuland, The Old New Land. The editorial board takes Germany to task for the rise of anti-Semitism happening now there. This is how the editorial board begins. I can't tell Jews to wear the kippah everywhere all the time in Germany, announced the country's commissioner for anti-Semitism, Felix Klein, on Saturday. Depressing advice, but honest. Wearing a yarmulke makes you a target for violent haters, and the country has seen a rise in out-of-nowhere assaults on Jews. Interior ministry stats show anti-Semitic offenses up by nearly 20%. The comment is important, and we have already spoken about it on this show, but it is critical for us to continue to engage and talk about it some more. Anti-Semitism is alive and well, and we need to focus and understand and act and react. The editors of the New York Post think the same. They continue. Klein's superiors, including Chancellor Angela Merkel, spent days walking back the statement, but they had to admit that Germany has a growing problem, a wrenching development for a nation that has spent decades dealing with its guilt in the Holocaust. Awkwardly, Merkel, the source of the rise in attacks on Jews, looks to be the huge wave of Muslim migrants that she allowed in starting in 2015, who carried hate with them from their homelands. Klein's honesty forced the rest of the government to step up, at least verbally, with Markel's spokesman vowing to ensure that anybody can move around securely with a skull cap in any place of our country. Pray they make good on that promise. Second up, also from the New York Post, is a column penned by Andrea Pizer. It's headlined, Shoah ABCs for AOC. It was published on June 20th, 2019, and online the day before, June 19th, 2019. Online, the title is Concentration Camp ABCs for AOC. Pizer lays out her argument on AOC's abuse of the Holocaust. AOC, as she has been nicknamed, is of course Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The use of her nickname somehow implies a sense of camaraderie with the person, a feeling I do not have. But I'm using AOC here simply because it is part of the op-ed's title. Andrea Pizer begins. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, educate yourself. The democratic socialist darling who wantedly tosses out phrases like concentration camp, fascist, and even insultingly appropriates the Holocaust-specific cry never again to slam U.S. policy on immigration should run, not walk, not meander to the Museum of Jewish Heritage in downtown Manhattan. Pizer continues tongue-in-cheek, saying, go and learn, and then takes a dig at Lucrezia Cortez by explaining how any Uber can drop her right at the door of a new museum exhibit with the cattle car that transported Jews to their deaths. She continues, Outside the museum, a small windowless wooden train car would greet Ocasio Cor AOC, who has shown willful blindness about Adolf Hitler's final solution, the wholesale mass murder, not only of millions of Jews during World War II, but of undesirables, including Roma, the disabled, and homosexuals. As explained in stark detail inside the new exhibition, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, 
Cars such as this one, each were packed with some 150 Jews, too many even to sit down, plus a bucket of water and another for human waste. The hideous trains of suffering chugged along slowly for the journey to the massive death camp complex in Poland. Many died en route. They were the lucky ones. Pizer concludes and offers perspective. I have no quarrel with Alexander Ocasio-Cortez defending the rights of immigrants flooding the southern border, a problem that existed before the dawn of Donald Trump's presidency. But I'd like to believe that using the horrors of mass slaughter to advance an unrelated agenda is simply an example of AOC being AOC, saying the most outrageous falsehoods she can fathom to garner attention. At least I hope she doesn't completely buy the rubbish exiting her mouth, does she? Finally, third up, is a column by Benny Avni about Turkey. It was published on June 25th. It is called, Now's the Time to Reclaim Turkey. The essence of the column is that Erdogan, his whole grip on Turkey seems to be weakening. His point is, that is Avni's point, is that local elections illustrate that this Islamic control on the country is slipping. Here is how Avni lays out his argument. Turkish voters dealt the country's once invincible president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, a sharp slap in the face on Saturday. America should use the moment to nudge Ankara, a NATO member, and erstwhile stalwart of the Atlantic Alliance back into the Western fold. An opposition mayoral contestant in Istanbul, Erkem Imagulu, handsomely beat Erdogan's favorite candidate by a nine-point margin. This came after Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, or AKP, canceled the results of an earlier election and ordered a redo because its candidate lost the first time around. Democratic-minded Turks are hopeful this marks the beginning of the end of their Islamist leader's increasingly oppressive rule. As politically weakened as he may be, however, Erdogan remains president until 2023 and therefore charged with conducting foreign policy. The question for the United States and its European allies is, can we leverage his unpopularity to force him to once more ally with Washington and NATO? Avni then comes to his conclusion by explaining that the United States must take advantage of this moment. Avni writes, Turkey's location makes it a desirable strategic ally for world powers. Erdogan has ignored centuries of enmity between his country and Russia and seems willing to turn away from NATO and America to embrace Vladimir Putin. As Erdogan's grip on power loosens, America must warn Erdogan that such realignment is neither in Turkey's interest nor his. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. Let's look at three cartoons today. The first is called Ayatollah Yusso and was published on June 24, 2019 by David Wamund. Donald Trump and John Bolton are in the desert talking to the Grand Ayatollah. Trump has a red crayon in his hand, and there are a series of red lines drawn in the sand. Trump says to Bolton, hey, did you see that? He called my bluff and crossed the red line again. Bolton says, I had told you so. <laughs> Next up is entitled AOC and Auschwitz. We talked about this a little bit earlier. It was published on June 25, 2019, it was drawn by Gary McCoy. AOC, initials again, standing outside the gates of Auschwitz with a Holocaust survivor. She asks, so how many undocumented immigrants were kept here? Finally, we have a cartoon titled Iran and More U.S. Sanctions. It was published June 25, 2019, drawn by Dave Granlund. The Grand Ayatollah is at his desk shredding papers. Papers read, sanctions from the U.S. and more. He says, been there, done that since 1979. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. The British Royal Air Force, the RAF, Defense Ops, tweeted about and confirmed a three-country joint training operation with the United States, Great Britain, and Israel. This was not just any training operation. This was a joint training exercise for the Lightning F-35B, the most advanced fighter jet in the world. One of the specifications of the F-35B 
is that it is a stealth jet. <laughs> the British released this, as well as a picture of six jets, two British, two US, and two Israelis, fighting in an arrowhead formation. That's like a V. Each of these countries flying two F-35s. The F-35 has already flown many missions for Israel, especially over Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. There are also rumblings about F-35, Israeli F-35s, flying several missions over Iran. Making this information public is very important. It is a clear statement to Iran. It tells Iran that these countries, these three countries, Great Britain, the United States, and Israel, each have the ability to enter Iran and leave without even being seen. The new elections in Israel, scheduled for September 17th, will certainly involve new parties. Two new parties are already in the works. One of these parties is headed by former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. He's the only person who actually defeated Bibi Netanyahu in an election. Barak was the leader of the Labour Party. The Labour Party has since imploded. Il Barak is putting together a great new team, including former foreign minister and head of the Kadima Party, Tzipi Livni. Also on the team are Dan Meridor, formerly Kub minister, Yair Golan, former deputy chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces. Rounding out this all-star team is Adina Bar Shalom. Bar Shalom is the extremely talented and very well-known daughter of Rav Avadia Yosef, the former chief rabbi of Israel and founder of Shas. The emergence of this party will leach from the new blue and white coalition. Barak has been rumored to also have been speaking to Yair Lapid, one of the heads of the blue and white party. Second party that we see is far less nationally and internationally enticing. The mayor of Tiberias, Ron Kobe, is its head. The name of the party is the Secular Right. Many more parties will emerge. Some will have better chances and others, but the field is open. The whole world knows that the Palestinians are not pleased with Trump's administration deal of the century. But the truth is that there are Israelis who are also not happy with him. And not simply the Prime Minister. Many leaders of the parties that will become part of the next coalition will find parts of the deal highly objectionable. Yet despite those problematic areas, Israel must say yes in principle to the deal of the century. Yes is how one gets a deal, a great deal certainly. A deal is a framework a text upon which to work. It's a draft. Some items stay in, some are changed, some are modified, some are improved, others come out. From Israel's point of view, some issues, like the question of security, will need to be re-referenced and re-evaluated. The best example we have from what we know so far is, the, uh, pub is linking Gaza with the West Bank via a train and highway. Israel has rejected this idea for decades, ever since it was first proposed. It was always nixed because of security purposes. Any route connecting Gaza with the West Bank would serve as an easy route of transport for terrorists and weapons. Israel needs to think this seriously because they, the deal they need to accept. So they need to figure out if they can handle this compromise. The Palestinians should have said yes and should be doing the same thing, figuring out how to compromise. USCC is the United States Cyber Command. USCC launched a recent retaliatory attack against Iran. Why the attack? Because the week the attack was launched, the big news was that Iran had attacked U.S. interests, striking tankers in the Sea of Oman. Lesser known news that week was that the Iranian cyber teams were also kept busy attacking many other interests in the region and beyond. In addition to the United States, Iranians attacked Saudis, Bahrainis, United Arab Emirates, and other U.S. computer systems. In response to the tanker attacks, probably exacerbated by tensions resulting from the computer systems attacks, or maybe the opposite, the USCC launched a barrage of attacks against the Iranians, especially their missile sil missile silos. It's important to note that the Ir Iranians' cyber aggression team is directly connected to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Many questions remain. We don't know if there is more of a response to come. It is also not clear why, the, uh, why and who hit the United States and how large the attack was. And we do not know if the U.S. hit the Guard's naval force at all. The military body that has weakened, been wreaking havoc in the region. What is clear is that cyber attack can be far more destructive than any missile attack. 
we learned that lesson from Stuxnet cyber virus and its attack against Iran. Stuxnet and the follow-up cyber strikes were enormously effective. Effective cyber attacks can set Iran back by months, even years. The downside is that with each U.S.-led attack, Iran improves its cyber defense capabilities. Israel is aware that Iran is feeling frustrated because the United States has not responded to their traps. The Iranians are also disappointed that the United States has not changed their policy towards them. So Israel thinks that Iran may decide to elevate the tensions with the United States and take them up a notch, up them to a higher level. That may mean attacking Israel, especially a border area in Israel. Iran would not make the move themselves. They would probably use Hezbollah as their proxy or utilize their forces in Syria wearing Syrian uniforms and attacking from Syrian positions. It's unrealistic for Iran to think that taunting the United States or U.S. allies will result in a changing U.S. policy towards Iran. And yet, that is exactly what Iran is hoping for. Israel will do it the, the best it can to intercept an attack or preemptively strike coming from Hezbollah or Syria. Remember, Israel is not limited to the restraints and constraints of the United States. Should Iran conduct an attack against them, Israel will almost certainly respond to a strike at the heart of the base that perpetrated the attack. Strange but positive things are going on between Israel and Gaza. Go figure. One of those things is related to sewage. The other is related to electricity. The Gaza sewage system is in a state of total collapse. Gaza's sewage system sends its waste overflowing into Israel, causing a real environmental and health hazard. Thousands of cubic meters of waste from Gaza flow into Israel every day. So, Israel has been intercepting the waste and piping it to Kibbutz Erez for treatment. But the Kibbutz pipes are too small and the plant is too tiny. So Israel came up with a different solution. There will be a new heavy-duty pipeline that will carry the waste directly from Beit Hanun and Beit Lachia in Gaza to the Sterot sewage treatment plant. This rerouting of Gaza's sewage waste will save both the western Negev and Gaza. Israel needs to handle the sewage issue because if ignored or mishandled, it could contaminate drinking water in the soil. Israel's drinking water comes from the aquifer, which is the natural purifier in the ground. There's more. It also looks like Israel will build a new electric line into Gaza, paid for by Qatar. Qatar has met with Israel, and they have come to an agreement. The cost and the actual amount of money that Qatar will pay has not been made public, but Qatar has already made several payments to Gaza for other projects, and that they total hundreds of millions of dollars. Things are looking up for Gaza. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. I began with geography. Unfortunately, most Americans are geographically illiterate. According to studies, they cannot even find the U.S. on an unmarked globe. But to really understand what is happening in the world, one needs to know geography. I used to use maps in all of my classes. I would draw maps as rectangles so students could understand what's next to what and what's on top or below. It's not just the location and the control of lands and places, but the names that give us clues to understanding and remembering geography. The Saudis do not call it the Persian Gulf. They call it the Arabian Gulf. To call it the Persian Gulf would be to give too much power and credit to Persia, which is today's Iran. On the other hand, the Iranians are tickled pink when we in the West call it the Persian Gulf, because that implies the dominance of the Iranians and Iranian history and power and influence. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We 
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.